This is chapter one, lesson one, uh, data analysis and analyzing categorical data. Um, so just some basics that we've kind of reviewed from chapter four, but individuals are the objects that uh, are described by our data set. And variables are the characteristics that they take on. So categorical variables uh, place people into different groups, uh, while quantitative variables would take numerical values. So in this case, like in your response bias project, you use categorical variables of yes and no, many of you. So you had a number of yeses and a number of noes, and you looked at those and you analyzed them, searching for response bias to see if it was statistically significant. So that's what we're talking about here, categories. Now, a key thing is a distribution. It tells us what values the variable takes and how often it takes these. What that basically means is it can be a graph. Uh, your bar graph was a distribution. It was a distribution of categorical variables of yes and no, and showed us how often the yeses were and how often the noes were. So we're going to be talking about distributions and the shapes they take throughout the year. So it's important to know when we're saying a distribution, we're just saying uh, what variables we have and the values that they take, um, how often they take those. So in simulations in class, it was how many trials did you end up pulling um, three women, four women, five women for the hiring discrimination case we did. Also a distribution, and we graph those. So um, remember, we want to always our goal is to make inferences. So to take our data, to draw conclusions from it, and then to have the right set of data so we can make inferences about uh, the population. So SRS to generalize to the population and random assignment for cause and effect. Some different types of distributions we'll be looking at are dot plots, um, which is what we did with the airline discrimination case. Uh, so in this case, with this graph that we use, this is the block six graph, uh, we used X's in places of the dots. Um, on the y-axis there, you have the number of trials. So it's how often um, we came up with two females being hired, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight females being hired. And the x-axis would be those values, the, the number, number of females hired. So this is a distribution. Instead of dots, we used x's because they're a little easier to see across the class. Other ways uh, that we will display data include stem plots, where uh, our data is organized by place value. So you'll have all the groups with uh, one in the tens place together and then the twos pl two place, and you'll, then you'll see all the, the values set to the right of those. So here's an example of a very simple stem plot uh, where the stems represent uh, the tens place, the leaves represent the ones place. So um, this one indicates that we have four values with two in the tens place, so that means our data set would be 23, 26, 20, and 22. And then the three, we have 35, 37, 32, 36, 33. One way to organize our data, and this is called the stem plot. Uh, we could also use a box plot, which breaks our data into quartiles, meaning into four sections um, by number. So uh, breaks it up into, shows you the first quarter, the second quarter, third quarter, and fourth quarter, and then let you know any outliers. So here we have a box plot um, plotted vertically. A lot of the times on our calculator we might see it plotted horizontally from left to right. So if you just turn this 90 degrees on its side, that's how we would see. We have um, outliers are marked here with the little box that's not filled in. Um, sometimes those will be used as X's as well outside. Uh, point plotted outside, you know it's an outlier. We'll get into what th that means. But we basically have the first quarter of our data down at the bottom here until you get to the 25th percentile. And then the second um, second quarter in between that and the median. Then you have the median to the 75th percentile with the third quarter. And finally, the top of the gray box to the top whisker is the fourth, per fourth quartile. Uh, so this is one way to look at data and figure out what's better to use, the mean or the median. Now, another type of data we'll use is a bar graph. Now, many of you guys are familiar with bar graphs um, and used similar, uh, used uh, simple bar graphs on your response bias project. Here's one that I thought was interesting, and it is just a little more complex. Let's zoom in and look at it. So uh, here's uh, a political uh, graph that looks at monthly change in total private employment. And you can see on the left, you start where uh, President Bush was president, and then where President Obama came in with the stimulus package, and where we have the job growth. Now, um, not trying to sway any political opinions here, just wanted to present a graph like this because it has negative values going down and positive values, and it also displays consecutive months. So it's a side-by-side -side bar graph, but it has uh, 
series of months. And so it really gives us a lot of rich information to have it side by side. And then you can follow the pattern if you were to draw a little curve over the top of it uh, to see what's going on with, um, with our graph there. So there's another type of bar graph, a uh, side by side one, a little more dynamic than your, your bar graph that you generally see. We also have pie charts. Um, so you've seen simple versions of those where the whole pie represents a whole and each part of it represents some fraction of that whole. So here's um, one about honeybees extinction. And this one just gets a little more complex with different sections of the pie. So there's more than, there's the simple way you've seen uh, the work presented. Or if you remember from the video we watched in class, um, where the size of each point represented the population. So those are almost like a pie chart in itself. And then when he broke, uh, for example, Africa up into its separate countries, each little dot, the total of all those countries was the same area as, as the original dot that was Africa because the populations add to the total population of Africa. So there's different ways to use these um, that are more dynamic than what you've seen in grade school and leading up to now. Uh, pie charts aren't a focus on the AP test, so we won't work a lot with them, but they can be a great way to represent your data. Uh, another way to represent data is a pictograph. Excuse me. Um, beware of these, because these can be really misleading, as you can see in this direct TV ad. Um, it's a picture, and the height is supposed to represent the number they're giving, but RI catches the whole area of the whole picture. So the area of direct TV here is much bigger at 95 than the 81 we see from Dish Network. Uh, it, this also makes look, the difference between 81 and 95 appear to be much bigger than the difference between 81 and 56, um, all leading to bias, which is what DirecTV wants to create. They want you to see that they're that much better. So they're even enhancing uh, their number here to their data here to, to try to sway you and be even more uh, more biased. So beware of pictographs because our eyes look at the total area when really that's misleading. So oftentimes pictographs can be misleading. Another way we'll represent data is a two-way table. Now a two-way table, uh, what may be different about it is that it, it has two different variables uh, with one representing the columns and the other representing the rows. So here you can see we have the rows represented by superpowers, uh, the choice of superpowers or preference of superpower of males and females that were in this survey. Um, and then you could see that the columns represent female and male. So perhaps they thought that gender was a strata here and they stratified their sample and now they're breaking it down so you can see how many more males prefer freezing time than females because um, they think that gender may be correlated to your answer there somehow. So we can use these to calculate marginal distributions. Marginal distributions are really just looking at one aspect of this. So how many, how many total people um, are female in here would be a marginal distribution. So the total columns allow us to calculate this. So how many total prefer invisibility? We could use 30 over 200 to calculate that it would be 15 percent. Uh, so a marginal distribution would be a value we calculate by taking the, the values in the total column and dividing them by the overall total down there in the lower right. So Marginal distribution gives us richer information, uh, gives us a percentage which may be more comparable, especially when we have samples of different sizes. So two-way tables always have two variables to display, uh, and they can give you richer information if uh, one of those variables somehow uh, is affecting the response to another one. So in this case, if the gender is affecting their choice of superpower. Now, a conditional distribution would describe, um, would take into account two things. So, what percent of females uh, prefer invisibility as their superpower? 15%. So, it takes into account two things. Both variables are being accounted for there. So, conditional distribution describes the value of that variable with another specific value of the second variable from the two-way table. So, an example of that would be how many percent of males that prefer super strength. Uh, and then you could compare that. So you could compare the percent of males, the conditional distribution for super strength and male and gender. So 20% males and only 3% females. So a conditional distribution takes into account two variables, whereas a marginal distribution is only looking at one variable. So for example, how many total people prefer invisibility? What percentage of the total prefer invisibility? Here we're looking uh, at counting for two variables with a conditional distribution. 
So two-way tables allow us to both calculate marginal distributions, which are uh, which we use with the total columns and the total rows at the bottom, and conditional distributions, which are dependent on two variables. So we have two specific values, one specific value of each variable. In this case, the gender, and then what they chose as their superpower would be conditional distributions, and notice that they're in percentages. So when we're deciding uh, what data to use and how we're going to use it, you always want to think um, what is the cause, what is the effect. In other words, what's my explanatory variable, what's my response variable. So that can help us decide how to plot uh, our graph, what's going to go on the X, what's going to go on the Y, should we use a bar graph, should we use a pie, a pie chart. You always want to find a way to be um, objective with the data, at least we do. Uh, many commercials or marketing involves the opposite of that, being subjective. But you want to say what is cause, what is the cause here, what is the effect? What's the cause or explanatory variable and what's the effect or the response that that's having? Um, a huge focus as we solve problems throughout the year will be how we organize our problems. So these four steps right here, state, plan, do, and conclude, um, will be what we're using for the remainder of the year when we solve a statistical problem. So we'll state the question that we're trying to answer, so that way we can be clear about what it is we're trying to do. That helps you just figure out what you want to do, but it also makes it clear to somebody else what you are doing going into the problem, so they can be objective in evaluating your work. Uh, step two would be planning. How are you going to answer the question? Are you going to find a z-score? Are you going to use the t-table? Um, all things that we're going to talk about, uh, t-statistic, as we go through the year. So what st statistical techniques are most appropriate and then why? That doesn't have to be an involved explanation. Uh, just quick, what's the statistical technique? Explanation why. Do is our third step. Carry out any needed calculations and any relevant graphs to show your work. Finally, conclude. Now this is where a lot of people get caught up. You have to conclude, so you have to use everything you said before. Um, you have to answer the question that you wrote in state, but you have to use uh, what your plan was and then the calculations you carried out to support all your points, and you have to answer in context of the problem. So you have to, you have to look at the problem, you have to say what was the problem, now I have to answer in terms of that problem. So it may vary, you may be calculating a t-statistic in two different problems. But the problem itself is different, so your conclusion would be different there. You'd say, my t statistic is this, and so therefore I will do, this is what I'm concluding. So always think about what my problem is or my question is before you conclude. So organizing, state, plan, do, conclude. So state what you're trying to answer, plan how you're going to answer it, do the calculations, any graphs, conclude in terms of the problem. Uh, finally, when we're looking at two variables, an explanatory variable or response variable, um, we, if we say that there's an association between them, that means that one, the values of one tend to occur in common with specific values of the other. Now, that just means that we see a pattern. When one increases, the other increases, or perhaps when one increases, the other decreases. Now, that does not mean that one of those is the explanatory and one of those is the response. That is a possibility. However, consider all the cases we've had where we've had a lurking variable. So perhaps they're both response variables to another explanatory variable. Um, so an association just means two things that happen together. Um, it may be an inverse pattern or it may be a linear pattern uh, between the two variables. But an association just means uh, one va you're seeing values of one variable that tend to occur with values of another. Simpson's paradox is something we're just going to touch on quickly because it's not covered on the AP test. But it's just when you, it's kind of accounting for a lurking variable. So when there seem to be two variables, uh, their values are changed or even reversed when, uh, when you consider a third variable. So in the book, they talk about um, how it seems by just looking at the data that helicopter, rescuing people in a helicopter, um, they're more likely to die or, uh, than uh, in the ambulance. The third variable that we account for there, though, is the severity of the incident. They're only calling out helicopters when there's a very severe incident. So it answers more severe incident calls, so therefore that's what's accounting for the higher death rate there. Again, that's not going to be a big focus for us as it's not covered on the AP test. Finally, here's a little link that explains two-way tables a little bit more uh, and is nice to refer to in our multiple choice question. A two-way table is a table with blank number of variables that can be, and can be used to calculate blank. So choose from the answers here. 
A, B, C, D, or E.